Well, good morning, everyone. This is my first ever Core 3 lecture. And yay! And I'm going to be talking to you about um, sort of my reflections on the Exodus narrative. Now, before we start, I thought I wanted to talk a little bit about what Exodus means to us now. Um, how many people here did not grow up in a Christian household? We have about five of the 255 that we have in the, the auditorium. And so, the Exodus story for us is a very, very close story. Uh, we've heard it many, many times um, and heard interpretations of the Exodus story. And we, we hold those close to our hearts. And many, many traditions um, would sort of balk at what I'm about to show you. And they would um, declare me a heretic, maybe, about some of the things that I'm going to be talking about. Because I'm going to be talking about things that might disturb the continuity that we maybe have built up in our faith. Um, the building up of this Exodus narrative uh, is sort of a chaotic event. And so when we're thinking about this Exodus narrative, we need to completely disassociate ourselves from the traditions that maybe we've grown up with and come up with a new way of looking at Exodus. And so, I think this movie here sort of illustrates what we need to do. At Faro High, Ramses was the biggest player around. No doubt. But when the new kid in school, I am a stranger in a strange land, realized hanging with the in crowd wasn't so easy, he took a stand. Man shall be ruled by law, not by the will of other men. Moses, Moses. Now the battle is on to see who can get the girl who will rule the school, and if a zero can become a hero. So let the games begin. Hey! From the creators of Must Love Jaws comes a comedy 3,000 years in the making. You're a sharp, clawed, treacherous little... Did you hear that? Charlton Heston, Yul Brenner, Sinead O'Connor, and Samuel L. Jackson as Principal Firebush. What happened here was a miracle, and I want you to acknowledge it. Ten things I hate about commandments. Now, obviously, that was a completely different interpretation of Cecil B. DeMille's um, The Ten Commandments. And I think that's sort of what we need to do when we're looking at Exodus. We need to completely throw away everything we've ever looked at or ever built up and look at it anew in much the same way that we looked at the Epic of Gilgamesh or any of these other documents that we haven't grown up with, we need to look at this document in a similar way. And so the question is, is the Exodus narrative, is the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, is, is the biblical witness itself an historical document or a theological document? And when we look at sort of what the the authors of the biblical witness and um, what they were doing and the sort of the context in which they were writing, they were primarily writing this as a document of faith. This was not to sort of give a, an accurate history, because history got in the way of the theological statements which they were saying, the theological statements which they want to, wanted to get across. And so we can see this as a document of faith. We can also see that this is not a historical narrative in many of the various intertextual conflicts or sort of the histories that conflict with each other within the Bible itself. And so the dates and the numbering and all these different things, there are conflicting ideas of history found throughout the biblical witness. And so um, there's really no way that we can 
look at this as a solely um, historical document. And also, there's a lack of archaeological evidence to support much of the Exodus uh, narrative for when the narrative itself says that it occurred. Now, there are other archaeological um, uh, findings that sort of support a, a limited Exodus narrative or a narrative where um, we do have a people coming out of Egypt and into uh, Palestine. Um, but it's more of a, um, uh, a theological text that we're looking at here. And so um, there are really no historical uh, statements that we can trust within the, the biblical witness itself. Now, how did we get to this um, history or this um, narrative that we have, this Exodus narrative? Well, to begin with, the narrative itself is sort of a conglomeration of a variety of different sources coming together. And we can actually see sort of what the original narrative was if we look at other parts of the, the Bible here. And so I wanted to actually just look at the Joshua text. And so if you have your Bible, let's go ahead and look at that Joshua text. Now, what we'll be reading here is actually a covenantal renewal ceremony that took place in Israel quite a few different times. And this covenantal renewal ceremony is sort of where we get this narrative, um, this retelling of the story of the Exodus event. So Joshua gathered together all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, summoning their elders, their leaders, their judges, and their officers. When they stood in the ranks before God, Joshua addressed all the people. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, in times past, your fathers down to Terah, father of Abraham and Nohor, dwelt beyond the river and served, the God, served other gods. But I brought your father Abraham from the region beyond the river and led him through the entire land of Canaan. I made his descendants numerous and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. To Esau I assigned the mountain region of Seir in which to settle, while Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron and smote Egypt with the prodig prodigies which I wrought in her midst. After I led you out of Egypt, and when you reached the sea, the Egyptians pursued your fathers to the Red Sea with chariots and horsemen. Because they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between your people and the Egyptians, upon whom he brought the sea to that it engulfed them. After you witnessed what I did to Egypt and dwelt a long time in the desert, I brought you into the land of the Amorites. And on it goes. And so we see that this these documents here are sort of the first narratives that we have for the Exodus event itself. And from these covenantal renewal services, these um, services where the people of Israel, the tribes of Israel came together and reaffirmed that they were together in this uh, confederation of tribes, this is where these stories came from. This is how the narrative itself was built up. And so we can see that the Israelites during this time were a loose confederation, as I said, of this, the 12 tribes that we've got. And they just, their only connection was the common agreement or the covenant that they had between um, all these various tribes. And the thing that we saw, even in our reading from Greer, is that not all of these tribes or not all of 